Friends, the grace and the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. It's good to be with you this first Sunday of Advent as we prepare ourselves for the coming of Jesus Christ. We prepare ourselves for Christmas when we celebrate Christ coming into our world, God becoming human, Christ being born in Bethlehem, and Christ coming again one day in final victory. So it's the season of Advent that we begin this Sunday as we prepare for Christ's coming. Friends, let us pray. Gracious Lord, we give you thanks for your coming through your Son, Jesus Christ, for sending your Son that we might have life, for sending your Holy Spirit at Pentecost that we might be filled with, with your fruit of grace and peace. Lord, we ask this morning that we're, however stress we might be that you would give us peace, that however scattered we might feel that you would bring us into unity, that however dark things might look, that you would shine your light upon us. We pray all this in the holy name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Hear now our scripture reading from the gospel of Luke at chapter 1. These th first three Sundays of Advent, we will be looking at the songs of Luke. In Luke chapter 1 and 2, there are four songs. Songs that are being sung with, uh, you know, Zechariah and Mary and Simeon and the angels crying out, filled with the Holy Spirit, praising God. And this first week is Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist. And he uh, has a song that he sings to the Lord. So let us hear this scripture from Luke chapter 1. And the father of John the Baptist, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear. In holiness and righteousness, before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people and the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise, the dawn, shall shine upon us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Friends, this is the word of God. It belongs to you, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my lips and the meditations of all of our hearts be holy and pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Speak to us a new word that your spirit may fall upon us like the dewfall. We pray all this in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Music is at the absolute core of God's life with us. Music is at the absolute core of God's life with us. St. Augustine, one of the early church fathers, said it like this. He said, when we sing, we pray twice. When we sing, we pray twice. What does he mean? We sing with our words and we sing with the, our melody, with the song coming out of our lips formed by our body. Singing mysteriously elevates us up to God and even at the same time, music is that which um, brings God down to us as well, making the distance between heaven and earth razor thin.
It has often been said that in Genesis 1, as God created with his word, while he said, let there be light, and there was light, it has often been said that he didn't just speak the world into existence, he sung it. And in fact, in the prophet Zephaniah, we're even told that, this is what it says, the Lord your God is among you. He is mighty to save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you over you with singing. The Lord will rejoice over you with singing. Yes, that's right. God rejoices over us. God sings over us even now, friends. In the beginning as God created us and even now. And if it's true that as Paul says in 2 Corinthians, wherever the Spirit is, there is freedom, It's equally true, we could say, that wherever the Spirit is, there is singing. God is singing to us, and in response, we are singing to God through Jesus Christ. This is what our choir at church helps us to do. This is why we are here to worship God. It's to sing in response to the God who has already sung to us and continues to sing to us in Jesus Christ. And so music is what it means for us to be human. And it is at the center of our life with God. God has enlisted us, you and me, friends, as singer priests, that we worship God as priests when we sing. God's plan is that all of creation, every tree, every field, every creature, would sing to the Lord. A new song. Now, isn't it sad that in our culture, the only things that we know by heart that we can sing, that is not a performance, it's not a concert, the only things we sing out of memory together, just for the sake of singing, is Happy Birthday and the National Anthem. That's it. Happy Birthday and the national anthem. Those are the only songs in our culture we have memorized that we sing, not for performance, but just to sing together. It's like we forgot the reason why we are to even sing. And yet we as the church know we sing to praise the Lord. This is who we're called to be. This is who we are. Here in our scripture reading this morning, we find John the Baptist's father, Zechariah, a singer priest, belting out a song of praise to God, declaring that the dawn will break upon us. The dawn of God's light will break upon us. It should come as no surprise then that we find so much singing in just the first two chapters of Luke's gospel because Luke's gospel talks more about the Holy Spirit than any of the other gospels. It's saturated with language of the Spirit. Jesus was filled with the Spirit and went and prayed. Jesus was filled with the Spirit and went and healed. Jesus was filled with the Spirit and went and preached. Spirit, Spirit, Spirit. And so here it tells us, Zechariah, filled with the Spirit, sung this song. And then he he starts, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has looked with favor on his people and redeemed them. And too often in Advent, friends, as we prepare for Christmas, Too often we hear the Christmas music drown out Advent. Just as we hear uh, the Christmas music and see the Christmas decorations seem to drown out Thanksgiving. It comes too early. It seems to be coming earlier and earlier each year, doesn't it? And if we're not careful, when we look at the nativity scenes, when we look at pictures uh, of Christmas and we see the smiles on the shepherds' faces, we see the smiles on the sheep uh, in the nativity scene, we forget that this was a hard time for Mary and Joseph. This was a hard time for John the Baptist's parents, Elizabeth and Zachariah, as they prepared 
for Christ's coming. They waited and waited in desperation, in hard times for God to come. They had plenty of opportunities to turn back, to to let go of their trust in God, to move on and not to wait for God, but they continued to hope in the Lord. We forget that tremendous trust and reckless faith that these priest singers like Zechariah this morning and, and Mary as we listen to her song in a couple weeks, that these singers shout forth this miraculous trust in God, this miraculous trust as they wait and wait for God to finally come to make all things new. And so this world that Zechariah was in was not safe. It wasn't easy. It wasn't comfortable. In fact, it was dangerous. In fact, it was filled with violence. In fact, it was filled with illness. You see, Herod was killing all the Jewish boys at the time. It tells us in Matthew's gospel. There was crushing taxes forced uh, Zechariah and others uh, and Mary and Joseph into a gridlocked poverty in lockstep with grueling oppression by the Roman Empire. I mean, the life expectancy was 40 years old at this time. Illness was sweeping over the region as leprosy was absolutely shredding apart people's bodies, their skin, as it disintegrated before them. God's presence seemed absent from the temple, making them wonder if he had totally abandoned them. They were beginning to doubt, as we might today, if God still speaks to us now. Sure, they might have said, God used to be in the temple, just as we might say, yeah, God used to speak to people, used to show up, um, as we see in, in the scriptures. But is God here with us now? I mean, all I see is death and destruction everywhere. I see illness. I see a pandemic. I see my finances falling apart. I see my family falling apart. I see relationships falling apart. Where is God? And so here we see Zechariah even in his desperation, even in the the difficulty of his time, he bets the whole farm on God's coming in Jesus Christ. He, He trusts, he hopes, he knows that God will come, that his light will shine upon us in Jesus, that all the darkness will be overcome by God's light. That all the shadows, all the valleys, all the pits, all the rock bottoms will be exposed by the light of Christ. That nothing will be untouched when Christ comes. And so still, no matter how dark it is out there, Zechariah reminds us, by the tender mercy of God, he says, the dawn on high shall break upon us. Christ will dawn upon us. Christ is coming. Well, I've had my lion's share of church trips throughout my life, going on mission trips, on retreats, on camps. But there's one particular church trip that sticks out of my sticks out and, and is always uh, impresses itself upon my mind in 2013 during a particularly dark time in my life i went on a spiritual retreat in a monastery in south carolina not far from charleston it was december it was winter things felt dark when, what I discovered there in that dim candle lit church on those overcast winter mornings was nothing short of miraculous. You see, I learned how to pray. I learned how to sing. I learned how to hope in God again. Just before dawn every morning, just as, 
as those before them have been doing for almost 2,000 years, these monks would sing the scriptures. Specifically, they would sing this song of Zechariah every morning. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has looked with favor on his people and redeemed them. Every single morning for thousands of years. Blessing God and singing forth their hope that Christ will come. Besides the now famous three mile an hour dog, Abby, that I mentioned uh, in a previous sermon, this place showed me something else about God. God's coming, God's advent, which means coming, is sure. As sure as the 12, 80 to 90 year old monks singing this song every single morning since they were 17 years old together. Just as sure as each dawn that the sun comes up. Just as sure as each winter is followed by the brightness of the sun or of the spring. So also at each morning bell on this Hollywood, South Carolina ground, this song will be sung without end, Zachariah's song. So too does God's son, Jesus, bring the, the, he's the morning star who will shine on us, who has come before in Bethlehem and will come again to make all things new and bring his kingdom. Zechariah again says to us, In the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will shine upon us. Jesus, the new dawn, whose orange hues and piercing rays will leave nothing untouched, nothing unchanged. He is coming. And he is coming soon. John the Baptist, this famous figure who prepares the way for Jesus and who always prepares us in the beginning of Advent for Christmas, he is always pointing away from himself and pointing to Jesus. He says, I must decrease, he must increase. And so if John prepares the way for Jesus, then we can say Zechariah, his father, prepares the one who will prepare the way for Jesus. Zechariah sings in his song, You, my son, will be the prophet of the Most High. Like Abraham offering his beloved son Isaac to God, here Zechariah offers that which is most precious to him, his only son, to God. His own firstborn son, who was only born after years and years of barrenness, of waiting, just like Abraham and and Sarah, waiting and waiting for a son to be born. Just as we are waiting and waiting for Christ to be born again and again into our hearts, into our world. And so what this tells us is that this song of Zacharias isn't a whim. It's not arbitrary or a spur of the moment. No, Zachariah has been pre- preparing to sing this song his entire life. He had waited year after year for a son. And then he offers that son over to God, over to the unknown, not knowing what will happen to him, but knowing who he is giving him over to. God. To be given over to God's service in the special role as prophet. And so although Zechariah is a background figure in the scriptures, he prepares and offers the one who will prepare the way for Jesus. Not too bad, right? We we often forget that we like Zechariah, are at best background figures in God's great story. God calls us to do small things with great love. And the things we do for God that we're called to do might not seem big. But like Zechariah, 
They pave the way for Jesus. They make, prepare the way for the Lord. And so the hope to which we are called this morning is built upon the raw foundations of patient waiting and trust. Zechariah waits for what feels to him like an eternity for a son to be born. And he waits for God to come again, to show up in the temple again, to make things new again, to make him sing again. But he is able to wait patiently because God filled him with the Holy Spirit. And in baptism, God has filled you and you and you and me with the Holy Spirit so that we can wait in hope in the Lord like Zechariah. Zechariah offered that which was most precious to him, his only son, to an unknown future as a token of his trust in God. Only after doing this, could he fully declare to us in the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will shine upon us. In light of Christ's coming to us in, in Bethlehem and his future coming to us with his kingdom, what might God be calling you to offer to him? What precious thing of yours might you be called to offer over to God even now, even this morning? How might you or your family or our church prepare the way for Christ's coming in a time like this, in a season like this? It might be you offering your time. It might be you waking up to pray and sing to the Lord every morning, the first 30 minutes. It might be you saying, you know what? I'm going to dedicate the first moment of every day to praise God, just as those monks did, just as Zachariah did. It might be giving of your resources, giving of your talents for the upbuilding of God's kingdom through the church, that we might be Christ's hands and feet for the world, his body. It might be forgiving someone. It might be asking forgiveness from someone. But God is calling us this Advent, this morning, to offer something precious of ours back to God and to hope that he is coming soon. Winter looks very different than spring, doesn't it? And dawn looks different than night. When Jesus shows up, when the dawn shines in the darkness from the tender mercy of our God, Jesus says all things will be changed. All things that are hidden will be revealed. All things will be touched. Things will shake. All the foundations of our earthly society, societies, our, our false kingdoms, um, of our own making, our others' makings, they will shake, they will come apart. Zechariah tells us our enemies will be placed at Christ's foot, his footstool. But if we remember anything about Zechariah's own son, John the Baptist, we remember that preparing for Christ's coming begins with us. It begins, begins with repentance. It begins with us taking an inventory of our own life and saying, God, I want to make room for you. As, your, as you come in the tender mercy with the dawn of Christ, I want to make room for you. So we prepare room for Christ in our hearts and it won't be comfortable, but it will be good. God offered his only son, Jesus, so that we, like Zechariah, might offer all that we are and all that we have back to God through Jesus too. 
Things are changing. Christ is coming. We stand in hope this morning. We stand on Christ, our rock, Christ, our hope. We are called to offer to God what is precious to us, even the bread and wine as we'll celebrate at the table. And if you can't join, if you can't join us this morning, please reach out. We'd love to connect with you and bring you Holy Communion that you might uh, dine with Christ and with us at the table. So we offer to God what's precious to us like bread and wine, trusting that God will transform these simple gifts into a feast, into his own presence with us, his people. Everything is changing as Christ comes. Bread and wine will become Christ's presence for us. Simple words said by Zechariah will be transformed and spirit-filled into song, into singing. Let us Await the dawn, friends. Like those old monks, like old Zachariah himself, let us await the dawn, the the light of Christ that's coming into the world. With the only weapon we have against the darkness and the only response appropriate to the light, with singing. God's new song has already begun. Can you hear it? Amen.